Hello, I'm Anthony Brandt, and we're here for another set of our conversations with artists, writers, and notable people on the East End. I'm here today with Dan Rizzi, whom I've known for not that long a time, but I've known him well enough, and I've read his book, that book, and uh, I found out he's a really good artist and a really interesting man. You grew up, Dan, all over the world. Yes, I did. You had a child in Cairo, in India, mm -hmm. in Jamaica. Yes. Where else? Um, Rome. Right, right after Cairo in, in Jordan, and Rome, as you mentioned, only because we were evacuated. Um, <clears throat> I can remember being evacuated through the Mandelbaum gates in Jerusalem, is that? Yeah, Have that's I got in it Jerusalem. Right? And seeing, you know, during, in the 50s, uh, some sort of upheaval somewhere in the Middle East. There were so many uh, that I really can't remember one from another being that young. But um, so we lived in, in, we lived, we, we lived in Cairo, Amman, Jordan afterwards, and then got evacuated to Rome for a while. So we, I, I lived in Rome for a while. Not, not a long time, but long yeah. enough to to remember it and, and, and love it to this day. Well, my wife and I spent a month in Rome. Right. And we got thoroughly sort of absorbed in the art and the ruins and everything else. But I've noticed in your work, you draw on a lot of sources from your childhood, but Rome never appears. There's no, there's no classical influence. That's, you're really the only person that's ever really noticed that, but it, it, it does in fact appear, and I'll tell you how how it does. Uh, if you look at a lot of my work, um, I, I pay special attention to surfaces and seem to be surface obsessed. Mm -hmm. And Rome is a town of surfaces and beautiful decay. And uh, that's, that's where, I, what, where I think I got that. Later on, I was more informed from um, traveling to, to, to Venice or to Florence and, and looking at the walls and uh, nothing th seemed to thrill me more than an, an old whitewashed wall that had been painted over a million times and I'd make a note in a little sketchbook and I have hundreds of them now they're all on my iPhone but photographs and stuff that just just the streets the walls and the surfaces of, of some some streets New York included uh, gave me this 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 idea mm -hmm. and I so that was a that was an interesting uh, observation but in fact um, it, it wasn't as literal a uh, um, an influence as some of my other ones <laughs> have you ever done any portraits of people yes yeah I'd like to do one of you as a matter of fact I do drawings uh, and um, when I was in graduate school uh, in Southern Methodist University uh, in Dallas, uh, Dan Flavin, mm -hmm. um, one of the artists who lived out here, uh, did, a, did a few weeks as a visiting artist there, and I really latched on to him. We became fast friends. And the way we met was he was sitting in the printmaking department of the art department that I studied at, and he had these little copper plates and he was doing quick little etchings mm -hmm. and he'd do these quick little drawings and he said you know the problem with a lot of art students today is they can't draw so I immediately pulled out my thing my little pad and I did a drawing of him and he we were friends after that <laughs> oh, he, he accepted cool. that it was, and <laughs> it really was cool because our friendship lasted till I'd moved out here he had a place out here right my wife, uh, Susan Lazarus, who's also an artist, was best friends with Flavin, and she actually has some of his drawings. I have the portrait he did of me, and uh, it's a treasured thing. Yeah. It's an etching, uh, but uh, she has some sailboat pictures of, of his. But yeah, I, I love to draw. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm, I'm a little afraid of it because it's, it's hard. <laughs> but uh, it's for instance, I, I know Certain subjects, I, I, I could draw you. I can tell you right now I could draw you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, another artist that I, that I knew uh, was uh, Frank Stella. Sure. 
He couldn't draw. No, but he could. He could he make. Could, he could make. Yeah, I, I met I met Frank when I was a student also, and he yeah. was I was I was sort of in awe of him. Well, I haven't seen him in a very long time, but we went to Princeton together. Sure, okay. We were in the same class, same club, as a matter of fact. And we used to hang out a bit, and we had a crowd of uh, literary wannabes like me <laughs> and painting wannabes like him and some other people. But both of you did pretty well. <laughs> yeah, we did fine. I have no complaints. But I've always been impressed by Frank. Uh, and Bob Caro was a friend of ours, too. And once you get in that kind of crowd, you're sunk, you're kind of sunk, yeah. Because that's your life. Yeah. It has to be your life. Yes. You know, when I graduated, I I thought to myself, well, I should probably get a job, shouldn't I? And I'd look for jobs, and I interviewed at various places, and they were all with business people, and I said, no way can I do this. This is hopeless. I can't do anything like this. I can relate. <laughs> yeah. And it was, uh, you know, well, I didn't want to talk about me. But anyway. I think the best way to do an interview is for both people to talk about each other. Because, like I said, I was reading about you. And I found a book that you wrote that I, I, I want to read. But the way we inform each other probably will influence the, yeah. the way we do this interview. But what you just said about when, when I... I went to four years of college and immediately went into two and a half years of graduate school. It took me a half year longer to get out of graduate school because the scholarship that I got at the time only allowed me to do a certain amount of classes and stuff. So yeah. I drove a truck. I drove a truck. I worked at an art gallery. I, you know, I lied my way into a bunch of jobs at art galleries, uh, just saying that I knew. For instance, I knew a lot about printmaking, which I do now, but at the time I was just interested in knowing yeah, a lot about it. Right. But um, I graduated and, 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 I, and I immediately got a job teaching at two local colleges, uh, Eastfield Junior College and Richland Junior College uh, on the outskirts of Dallas. And I did that for about a year and I thought, I, 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 don't, I don't even want to teach, I want to make art. But making art, <laughs> How are you going to make a living? Yeah. And I remember when I quit teaching, my father said, what, what, what do you mean you quit teaching? Right. You went to six years of college, and now you're quitting teaching? I said, yeah, but I want to be an artist. I'm, you know, and I was starting to, mm -hmm. to show my work here and there. And he goes, this, this kills me about my father. He goes, well, what am I going to tell people? <laughs> I, I love saying my, my, my <laughs> son, the college professor. <laughs> Who cares said, what you tell yeah, people? <laughs> you tell him. He's your son, the artist. And it took him a while to be really proud and accept that. But yeah. a lot of his, you know, when I told him I wanted to be an artist when I was younger, he said, well, isn't art more of a hobby? And even though my father was very, very savvy to the arts. Exactly. He put on exhibitions of the arts all over the world. Yes. Yes, he did. As a matter of fact... He's responsible for me being an, uh, an artist. He put a show up in New Delhi, India. Um, never quite sure what my father did. You know, he worked for the uh, USC, USIA, USCIA. There was, there was mm -hmm. this and then. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, <clears throat> Frank, I met Frank Zappa once, and uh, i got to drop some names. Bob Dylan told me to never drop names. But I met Frank Zappa, and um, he said... I told him in a conversation like you and I are having what my father did, he goes, oh, your father was a spook. <laughs> of course. I said, no, he, he, he said, trust me. He your was father a was a spook. And I did dig deeper, and I found out that he did work for the CIA. Yeah. And just never mentioned it. But uh, when I finally became an artist and had a successful show, I remember my father walking around the gallery in Dallas. I had a one-man show, and... He didn't have a calculator with him, but he was just going around. Wherever, wherever there was a red dot, he'd look at it, and then he'd come back and tell me, do you know how much money you made tonight? <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is a, this is a long shot from <laughs> yeah. isn't art just a hobby? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> There's a lot of pretty girls here. Yeah. yeah. Well, my, my parents had a hard time with me even taking 
literature courses. Sure, I can, I can, I can totally relate and, to that. And yeah. I stayed up with them one night, which we never did, until 2 o'clock in the morning arguing about it. But finally, they could see that I was serious, and they let it go. They never said another word about it. And then he got me a job after I graduated with an insurance company as a trainee, and he was in insurance. And I stood it for about four months, and it was horrible. Really, the most boring thing I've ever yeah, done. Yeah, I don't in my see life. you. I don't see you in that and, position, uh, Tony. I quit, <laughs> and I went to work in a bookstore, and took whatever job I could. And then I went back to graduate school, and for that I taught for uh, one one year at Hunter College, freshman composition. I was really bad at it. I taught also, and I was really bad. Yeah, <laughs> At I least knew. I think I was a bad teacher. No, I, I knew <laughs> I was a bad teacher. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they fired me, and then I didn't have a job, and then I got a very strange job, which I'll tell you about another time. But it, it turned out to be very remunerative because it was for a very rich man, and when he died, he left me seven years' salary tax-free, paid out again over seven years. And that enabled me to do finally what I wanted to do, which was right. That's a great story. I love that. Well, I love that there's people out there that know that's what you need. Because you're never going to ask anyone, uh, could you support me for the next seven years while I work on my book? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and it's just, I mean... Uh, that's when I think about things like the Dia Art Foundation, of which Flavin and, and, and uh, uh, gosh, Cy Twombly, yeah. guys that became very financially stable. There were still foundations around that yeah. support the arts. Uh, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the things over the last four years that I've felt, you know, hungry for mm -hmm. is the lack of art in this administration, not to mention the lack of humor. A lack of pretty much everything. I was wondering how long it would take us to get political, but, you know, just on that one, that one th subject, it's, you know, no, no, no humor, no art, no, no literature. No, right, nothing. No, no nothing, no, There's not no, dog. <laughs> no dog. No dog. You can have a dog. <laughs> yeah, I've seen house. the list, too. No dog is I've got to a make. joke, I could, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> no. <laughs> So I found your, your work very interesting and a little strange and off-putting, but very singular. There's no other artist I know who does anything close to this. <laughs> and, and that's always a plus in my book. Well, that's, that is possibly the best compliment you could give me because I constantly worry about, I mean, I started out working in a very minimal way mm -hmm. and I thought, and I was influenced by uh, Kazimir Mayevich, the yeah. Russian constructivism. I just thought, well, this is where minimalism came from. This is where Barnett Newman learned mm -hmm. how to do it. And Barnett and, and, and Bryce Marden looked at Barnett Newman mm -hmm. and Ellsworth Kelly. And mm -hmm. these guys all started doing these squares and, you know, because it, it, it spoke to me. I just understood it. I understood the I could look at, at, at a, a, a Mayevich composition and, and it, it was like, I just, I completely related to it. Mm -hmm. So I would try not to yeah. be influenced. I mean, not to steal. No, but I think, I, I think all artists really, well, writers, co comedians, I think you take from wherever the... Wherever it comes from. I mean, you don't want to just imitate <laughs> the person. No, nobody wants to imitate. But, but there's but, a great pool of created images in the world. Huge, huge, huge history of art. Yeah, yeah. It goes way back yeah. to uh, the Egyptians and way beyond that, yeah. and to primitive art and all yeah, kinds I, I'm of sure. forces. I'm sure. And I get the feeling from you that you, you went and picked and chose elements from here, there, and everywhere. You have an element of Indian Art in your in your work, uh, you have an element of pure abstraction in your work. You have an element of the filigree, the arabesque. Yeah, come from the Matisse window paintings. <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> and it all comes from somewhere, but you combine it in your own particular way, which is, is very interesting. Well, that makes me feel great, and I, and I, I, I haven't really had, had an opportunity to, 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 to discuss that, but uh, I, I really feel like you, you nailed it on that. Um, if, if, if I had to, not complain, but if I had to, to say one of the things that was sort of strange about my upbringing was that I was in so many diverse, mm -hmm. play, differently, differently structured, different, different religious, different uh, aesthetics, like going from Poughkeepsie, New York, to Cairo, Egypt, to Amman, Jordan, to my grandmother's farm up in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where my mother was born while my father was overseas doing God knows what mm -hmm. in the Middle East and then saying, okay, it's safe for you to come now. And, you know, saying goodbye to the cows, literally, you know, that you mm -hmm. milk twice a day. And I, I was spoiled, but my uncle would make me do stuff, you know. You shovel, shovel some manure if you want to <laughs> learn how to be somebody. Um, <laughs> So I had that, but but it was it was just the way I was informed. It was impossible to not be influenced by all that stuff. Yeah. And um, one of the things I wanted to tell you was about. I went back to y y you. You definitely see the the Indian influence. Um, uh, as a as a young high school high school student, I went to ta the Taj Mahal with a school group, and I was blown away, mm -hmm. not so much, I mean, I was blown away by the structure and the story and the, the view, but I was blown away by the walls, the surfaces and the, the inlay, the filigree, the, 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 the sawtoothed tulip. Yeah. And it just stayed with me. And years later, I started these paintings that just, I thought just came out of the blue, but they really didn't. They were, came directly out of that Islamic architecture, of which there was a tomb right across the street from where we lived in Nizamuddin East in New Delhi. But I, I looked at these structures and shapes all day long, all day long for years. And uh, when I started painting them, it was, it was like opening up a floodgate. Mm -hmm. And I went back to Delhi with this friend of mine, like, and I had a couple catalogs with me. And we hired a driver in Delhi to take us to the Taj Mahal, and I had a catalog which had a, an English, uh, had a had an Indian composition, like it was arabesque and a sawtooth tulip, and put together in my own way. And the driver of the car looked at it and he said, "Oh, the Taj Mahal." <laughs> and it, I said, he says, "When did you paint this yesterday?" Or do you? I said, "No, I, I painted this a few years ago, but I saw it." 20 some odd years ago, and now I'm seeing it again, and it just, I mean, my jaw dropped. Yeah. Because I literally copied it. Yeah. But I didn't have a picture of, of it there. I didn't have a pic, but uh, it was, you know, real, you know, mm -hmm. influence that just came right up and bit me, you know. And well, if you're, it's, if you're sensitive to images and artwork, it can have a very powerful effect on you. Yeah. And I had that with the Caravaggios. And when we were in Rome, we saw every single Caravaggio we could find. But the one that really got to me was uh, the calling of St. Matthew, which is in the French church. And I started, when I saw it, I started to tremble. Yeah, you, you, you got... Uh I got what is known as the Stendhal Stendhal's, Stendhal. yeah. Stendhal Stendhal. Stendhal. And I did, I wrote a book about Rome. I had to, because it had such a powerful impact on me. And it, I could never sell it, but it sits there. And I may publish it myself one of these days. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, the Stendhal's uh, condition or whatever. Stendhal, syndrome. Stendhal's syndrome. Wasn't it uh, first... At, at, uh, in Florence, at the, yes. at the Uffizi? Uh, no, it was at the Santa Croce. Okay, yeah, it was overcome. Overcome by... by and I totally a, get it. An obscure artist. And, and but Caravaggio, standing in front of a Caravaggio, I can think, one of the ones that always got me was the card players. Yeah. 
you know, because it, 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 it's such a magnificent painting. And even for an artist to look at it, another artist's work and go, oh my God, how did he do that? Uh, and then it, it has this, this sort of uh, narrative to it, too, also. This, you know, the guy hiding the card behind it. There's yeah. some humor and there's some... Right. No, it's, no. He was, he's a great, he's a great artist to, yeah. to just stand crazy, in front crazy of. Crazy man, but a wonderful artist. One yeah. of the, one of the greats. He played tennis too. Court tennis. <laughs> <laughs> Got in a little bit of trouble, didn't he? Yes, he killed someone. <laughs> he killed someone over a game. Over a court tennis game. <laughs> a good sports <laughs> fan, Caravaggio. That's they don't really. They don't make them like that. They anymore. don't make them like that anymore. They don't talk about them like that anymore. <laughs> These guys, you know, I. I don't like the way you played this game, so I'm going to kill you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to get back to the studio. <laughs> well, I took him to Sicily to get out of there, and then to Malta and wherever. Oh, else. you know the yeah, you know yeah, the real I know detail. The yeah. I used to write for Connoisseur. Oh, great magazine. Yes. Yes. Uh, Tom Hoving was a friend of mine. Great man. And he taught me. Everything I know about art, we're all crime, which is a lot. He, he was qualified to speak about it. He knew yes, a he, whole, yes. whole lot of yes. nasty little secrets. <laughs> I met him a couple times. He, uh, he told me once how he got an Italian vase relief <coughs> out of Italy. In a suitcase? No. <laughs> he, uh, he had his kids there. And he rented a station wagon, and he put a, uh, a mattress in the back where the kids can play, and underneath the mattress, he took bas relief. That's bas relief, isn't it? Yeah, bas relief, yeah. Right. And when they got to uh, the border, the Swiss border, where everything is free and you can do anything you want, uh, he, the kids were in the back playing on the mattress. And the guards just waved him through. <laughs> great. That's a that's a great story for for a film or yeah, yeah. You know. He was that kind of guy. I think when we um, when we lived when we lived in Egypt, I can remember going to the pyramids with my my father and mother. My brother wasn't born yet. My sister was very young. I was seven or eight. She was probably five. And I remember being horribly disappointed because any first grade student can tell you what the pyramids exist and where mm -hmm. they are probably, you know. They'd say Egypt or they'd say Giza or not or give you, you know, the actual... <coughs> they don't give you coordinates. Yeah, but coordinates. <laughs> but I remember seeing them in the Sphinx and thinking, man, these things look like hell. Yeah, right. They just got the shit beat out of them. Right. I'm sorry just to say something like that. <laughs> That's all right. Can we speak openly? But I remember being, you know, because the line, the the the, the plates that I'd seen in mag in books and, and volumes and even reading about them, they all looked hard edged to me, you know. And I love mm -hmm. the shape, and I've used it in my work before, just the geometric shape. Um, but I was deeply disappointed in the uh, um, fact that they weren't smooth. And uh, still kind of blown away by them. But we, at that time, would dig. Just sort of, uh, there was no restrictions on it back then. I mean, you couldn't walk into a museum, or you couldn't walk, walk off with a <laughs> huge <laughs> head or something like that. But, my mother still has these little tiny heads. I don't know if they're authentic. Some things of which they found, you know. Because mm -hmm. we went to Petra, we went, went to all these places. We always do a little bit of digging, and, you know, you'd, I'd end up putting some stuff in my pocket. <laughs> that, um, um, well, Lorraine and I, uh, I had to do a story for, for uh, Connoisseur Magazine, as a matter of fact, on Belize. It was a travel story. In Central America, right? Yeah. Belize City? Well, or the, the whole country. country. Yeah. 
And one of the things that we felt we had to do was to go to a, a Mayan dig because they were active then. And we, uh, we flew to a little place called Orange Walk, which was just an airstrip, a grass airstrip and nothing else. And we were met there by a guy we had met at dinner the night before, two nights before. And he had a Ford Bronco four-wheel drive. And he took us down this road, and then the car couldn't go any further because it was all mud, and then we had to walk into the site. We walked past a Salvadoran refugee place where they were playing this loud Spanish music, and we waved, you know, hola, hola. <laughs> <laughs> we're fluent. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got there. And there were armed guards patrolling the place because what they were digging up, they showed us, was unbelievable. Mayan jades of all oh kind, God. pottery, you know, with the, with the beautiful drawings on them. And they kept it in a little, it wasn't even a shack. It was in an enclosure made out of chicken wire. And these are museum pieces, by the way. They're all museum yeah. pieces, and they all belong to the country, but, uh, you know, the archaeologists get some to get, take back to their own museums. And he pulled out drawer after drawer after drawer, and we kept seeing this stuff. And then they showed us this, uh, this pyramid of their own that they were just excavating, and then they showed us uh, some of the steles that they were digging up. And the, some guy was there drawing them very meticulously to get everything right, because they can be translated now. They, they learned how to do that. And I just was just staggered by this whole thing. Yeah. Because you don't often see this. You don't often see it coming out of the ground right in front of your eyes. And I was thrilled to death. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by it also. Um, I had a fr when I lived in Texas, I had a friend who lived uh, outside of Santa Fe, and he got he he got to where he could recognize these mounds, mm -hmm. and showed me. Um, he also was married to someone who I think they were sort of independently wealthy at the time. This is 35, 40 years ago because I was really impressed with them living out there in sort of an adobe house and mm -hmm. just this sort of beautiful scrubby desert all the way around them. And I, <clears throat> I love making collage. I love fitting pieces of things together. And he showed me this almost complete, and I, I can't tell you what, what the time period was for this bowl, but it was a, a gorgeous red clay bowl and he, he, he found the pieces and, and started assembling it back together and I said God can you can we do this can I do this <laughs> yeah. and he goes well this took me a year to do this but I can take you out to this mound mm -hmm. and sure enough you know you just started scraping and there's something uh, uh, you know supernatural and surreal about it you're 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 probably the first person to hold this thing in hundreds of years, mm -hmm. you know? And you start thinking, as lots of artists do, you know, and, and romanticizing about it. But um, I remember trading him a piece of artwork for one of his bowls. Really? And uh, he he's sort of gotten informed. I mean, he made the bowl himself. Uh, and it, it's, I still have it and, and painted it, very mm -hmm. much like the pieces of pottery that he dug up that were hundreds of years old. So, uh, you know, back to the, the, the idea of, of influence and w where it comes from, I used, to, I used to fear being, um, having, having writer's block or artist's block. Uh -huh. I feared it because I, I've, I've had it before. I, that there was a time in graduate school where I just thought I'd tried everything and nothing was working and, I, and I, I'm gonna be a miserable failure and I need to have my own ideas and my ideas are too much like someone else's. I was, I was really floundering around in between and until I found something that I was able to grab onto and 
and grow with it and push it forward, um, you know, my influences were going to the art library and I'd, I'd look at, I'd look at, you know, uh, I remember picking up an art forum in the mm -hmm. art library at SMU where I worked, putting slides together when I wasn't teaching to try and, you know, pay, pay our way through. Um, I graduated with very little debt, by the way, and I feel for kids today who have these tremendous debts yeah. to start their lives with. I started mine with, you know, about a $10,000 debt, which was a lot of money at the time, mm -hmm. but I was able to work around it. Uh, but that said, I remember picking up this art forum and there was a Bryce Marden painting on the cover. And it was just a square of color. And there were some of the students there who were like, you know, oh, you know, painting's dead. Um, I, I don't painting will never be dead. Painting will never die. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's like saying writing's dead. You yeah, know? exactly. But uh, the, the influences can come from anywhere. I mean, one other kind of amusing anecdote is, is the competition that went on between uh, Picasso and uh, Brock, mm -hmm. the, the cub cubism fights. Mm -hmm. You know, where I've read so much about both those artists that there were times when supposedly Brock would hide paintings from Picasso because P Picasso was ruthless. Mm -hmm. He said it was okay to copy other people, but not to copy yourself. He said copying other people is a necessity, but copying yourself yeah, is a no-no. That's no good. So, um, you know, it's just, I've, this is the first year I haven't gone to Italy, and I feel like I'm, uh, for 25 years, my wife and I, who have only been husband and wife for seven years, but for the last 25 years, we've managed to go every year. We didn't go on 9-11, we didn't go. But, uh, and we couldn't go this year, I had tickets, to go to uh, um, already paid and hotel reservations. And that's where I feel like if, as corny as it sounds, you recharge your batteries, that's where, you, that's where I do it in Italy. Yeah. I mean, we both, I can just tell by the way you talk about Rome, it's, to me, I... I it was my eye, eye opening, eye yeah, blazingly just, opened. I mean, uh, certain, I, I went over there to one year for the sole purpose of meeting Cy Twombly. And I, had a, I knew somebody who knew him, who had bought one of his drawings, mm -hmm. and actually gave Cy Twombly a piece of my artwork. And uh, we got a meeting to where we were able to walk down the Spanish steps and mm -hmm. turn right there and go up to some really cool place behind a, a huge, enormous door, and voila, that's where Cy Twombly and his... Mm -hmm. His wife lived at one end, and he lived at the other, and they had a son. But I got, you know, he painted in an old ballroom as you walked across the floor. The tiles kind of yeah. clicked. There was still gold leaf on some of the doors. Yeah. It was it was the type of beauty that you would imagine that guy would want, want to be able to live with, you know. And then he, and he told me about a couple of restaurants, and we went out to eat. And, <laughs> yeah. and I go back, every time I go back, I relive that, you know. No. Along with other things, too, but, yeah, but the no. memories are, I mean, if you spend a month there, you must. Wait, that, no, that I could, soaked it up. That could be a lifetime in, a, in, in, in what, you, what you soak up. You well, know? We, yeah, we went to museums almost every day. I did a story in uh, Sweden in an island they, there called Gotland, and it's a really old island with really, really old churches and many, many churches. <clears throat> and I was alone, and I had 10 days, which was too long, but it was, I went to a church every day. Every day is church, because each church, they were small. They weren't as, they were barely larger than this room. And there would always be a carved wooden saint, medieval in, in, in origin, medieval in age, and it was just, there was something about it that it, it really burns into you. Yeah. And I used to climb around the churches because they were always empty. And you'd go in the, in the attic and you'd find dead pigeons because they got trapped in there. And the whole thing was fascinating. That's great that you, that you thought to do that. Well. I mean, I, I 
I love doing stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, I won't go on private property if there's anybody, if they, if they make a thing about it. And I'm very respectful of other people's space and stuff like that. But this is public. Yeah. Good point. And Rome is public. And you can wander around there and get lost. And you're not sorry you got, you got lost because no. there's always something. Yeah, that's... Always. You round a corner and there's some... You know, this little alleyway where there are vines on all the balconies. And, right, yeah. And, uh, I love that, yeah. Yeah, so do I. There's a, we go to this, uh, oh, we go to Lake Como. Um, Never been there. It's, one of the reasons we go there is uh, for the last five years I've taken my, my mother, who's going to be 97, so... She was always in her 90s, uh, and she, my father had gone to Italy many times together, many, many times. And we actually owned a house up above Lake Como in a little piccolo paese, small little town called Arbizzo. And that's where my grandmother was when she and my grandfather came to America. I guess she was born there, and there's a little church there. And I was determined to take my girlfriend at the time, mm -hmm. my fiance, Susan there. And we went there in the middle of a, of a rainstorm and we actually jumped out of the little car that I'd rented and ran and the doors were swinging like this. It kind of reminded me of you saying, looking, and it was a tiny little church, but, but filled with, with just lovely artifacts and things. Mm -hmm. And we closed the door and uh, lit a few candles and sat, sat out the storm in there. And it was one of the most extraordinary experiences, even though nothing really happened. It, it's still, it, it, I still can get something out of it when I think about it. And I remember taking my mother back to that church because she took, it, took me to that church when I was a little kid. And we went up and stayed for 10 days with our relatives up there, which was totally bizarre. Mm -hmm. I didn't speak Italian. My mother speaks Italian. Um, I mean, I knew enough to, mm -hmm. because I grew up in a time when my grandmother and my mother would speak Italian. That was so they could talk about stuff that they didn't want you to be right. privy to. You know, it's, it wasn't the touchy-feely uh, situation we have now where, where parents actually tell their children, <laughs> here's what that means. It's, it's like no. my father was famous. Look it up. <laughs> Look it up if you don't know what it is. Um, but um, so that was really interesting to be there and, and to go back. And um, we go, we stay at this hotel in, in Lake Como. Como is kind of a touristy place, but mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And we go at the end of the tourist season, so mm -hmm. most of them are gone. And we go over to, to jump on the ferries and go to the little towns and always, 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 without fail, go to the church. Can't. You yeah. can't go to one of those towns. And as you said, it's public. You, 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 walk, you walk in, walk right in. And um, my last five years that we've taken my mother there, um, her, her relatives have this, you know, built-in ESP. They sort of know what, when we're going to be there, and they, they come down out of the hills, sort of like a bad Patrick Swayze movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Country. And... There's, uh, you know, Armando, and there's uh, uh, a cousin, and, a, and, a, and they all look at me and say, see my father, and, you know, because they mm -hmm. remember my father mm -hmm. came over in the 50s and the 60s, and we own this little house up there, which my father sold, and my father and I didn't speak to each other for about a year because I was furious with him. I said, I would have bought that house. He, I think, you know, he sold it for... Yeah. for in, he didn't, I don't think he understood that it, that, that, that it should have stayed in the family. He didn't think it was worth that much. Or, and that, that, what it was worth yeah. was not money. It was worth uh, uh, family and history and story. Yeah, and no, I still, I, when I see I the understand. house, I, I get kind of upset. Because right. I, I, I would have used he, he said, well, I didn't know you would use it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't want a house in the hills near Switzerland overlooking Lake Como. Nah. <laughs> Why would I want to be 
in a silly <laughs> yeah. little town. Bothered with yeah. that, with the burden of yeah. that. <laughs> well, my, my family had a little house at the Jersey Shore, which uh, my brother, I had, I had an older brother. <clears throat> and when they died and my mother had Alzheimer's and it was all, everything was done, he gave me a choice. He said, I want the house at the shore. This is your older brother? My older brother. Okay. My only brother. And, uh, and you can have all the stocks and bonds. And I didn't want the house at the shore. I have a house at the shore. And I was really happy here. So I got the stocks and bonds and uh, it has stood me extremely well. Good, good. <laughs> That's how we have our house now, which we own so, free. But you've been here for 40 years. Yeah. I mean, when, when you moved here 40 years ago, did you move here and stay year-round? Yeah, I, did. I was living before then in an apartment in Ossining, New York. Oh, I know, yeah, I know Ossining. And uh, my ex-wife, was had, she had moved to New Mexico, and she had taken the two, her two sons, no, I'm sorry, My brother's ex-wife took his two sons to Arizona. My ex-wife moved to New Mexico, but none of, none of my two children wanted to have anything to do with New, New Mexico. They were totally uninterested. It was actually a good place for her because she went to work with the Navajo tribe for the federal government, and uh, she bought her own house. And In Santa Fe? No, it was in, in, in nowhere, in a little village called Continental Divide. I haven't seen her since. Which is and just, she moved to Continental just, Divide. Just as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, uh, she blamed me for everything, and probably I deserve a good part of it. But anyway, we have, uh, I have a friend. It's amazing how your exes, all, all, all of my exes blame me for well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. What can I say? <laughs> <clears throat> but I have a friend in Rome, and uh, we had an experience out there with him. Uh, he took us in his car. We were staying in central Rome, really close to everything. And he came and picked us up and took us out on this ring road, and then we went up to a place called... Uh, Calcutta, little tiny village, perched on the top of a of a glacial sort of cone. Mm -hmm. Tiny. I mean, again, it was like twice the size of this room, with buildings and you know, it was all yeah. owned by uh, by Romans who used them as vacation homes. And we ate there, and we had a nice meal. And I was curious about the place, so I looked it up. And it turned out that their church there, which we didn't bother going in, which I regret now, uh, claimed to have a relic. And the relic was Christ's prepus. Do you know what a prepus is? Yeah, well. It's a foreskin. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> Christ's foreskin. Yeah, and this story, it was wow. a, it was given to the Put Pope. Put that on eBay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was given. <laughs> that's a funny thought. <laughs> it was given to the uh, Pope by Charlemagne in 800 when he was crowned the Holy Roman Empire. And where did Emperor. Charlemagne get it? <laughs> well, he he claimed that. I, I have no idea. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> but he claimed that it came with, uh, but in a, you know, it's got a long story associated with it, but somebody had told an Arab woman at, at the time Christ was born that 
they should pay attention to this. And so they got the prepost and they put it in a little alabaster box and they soaked it in oil. So That's the best way to keep a prepost. Yeah, it's absolutely. An alabaster. But yes. <laughs> that I do know. You do know that. No, yeah. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> they kept it uh, in the St. Saint John Lateran outside the walls in the big church before the, mm -hmm. the Vatican itself was, was built. And, and then in 1527, Rome was sacked for the last time by uh, a later French king and his minions and all that. In the wars, the Italian wars, they were held. And it wound up in this little tiny church in Calcutta, where they Amazing. caught the guy who stole it. And they took it back and they kept it there. And they kept it there because, my God, this is the only thing left of Christ on earth. <laughs> I didn't even, I gotta admit, I didn't even know he was circumcised. Well, I don't think anybody <laughs> now, does. Now. <laughs> I knew I was going to learn something. Today. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then it was stolen in uh, like 1970 or something. A priest stole it and it disappeared and they thought it was lost forever. But the story is that 17 other churches in Europe have Christ's prepus. Yeah, but not the real one. Not the real <laughs> one. <laughs> I kind of love that stuff. I love, uh, I love that you can go to these little churches and find something that y mm -hmm. you know you you might need a like in my situation a, a cousin or a relative to tell you what this is or who you know this this is a, something that Jesus held in his hand or. You know whether it, whether it's real or not, it the 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 feeling still gets transmitted. Yeah. Um, as a kid going to Jerusalem, uh, looking at the spot where Jesus, where supposedly supposedly Jesus was born, and um, you know I I've, I've never believed, disbelieved, known or not known. But I do remember going there and, mm -hmm. uh, and feeling some sort of mystery and awe about. Well, don't you think that, that places gather a certain yes yeah. from from the people who come there? They gather a certain energy, a certain and subterranean I, I, energy. But I think the, the ob yeah, yeah, and the object is, is 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 important to me. The way I you know I frame stuff uh, that that. I, I find bits and pieces of stuff in, in flea markets, and old pieces of paper. Um, somehow, it, 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 the two, you know, my, my love of, 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 of little objects, and you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still thr I'm thrilled to walk around. I was walking around in New York the other day, and even though I don't feel comfortable doing it now, I found some great little things on the, on the street that you know ended up in a painting. Uh, why not? Yeah, why not? I, uh, Tell me about houses, by the way. This house motif. Uh, the house motif, um, at the time, I thought, I, I was so frustrated with the artwork that I was making. I thought, I'm going to make a series of paintings that are so simple. And a lot of these were, were, were based on, on some of the earlier works of Mayevich and the more minimal works of his, but I wasn't really looking at an American art. I made, I made these little white boxes, and the, this goes back to what I said a few minutes ago about objects. I, I wanted it, I wanted to make a box that had a painting in it, um, and the box, they were all the same size. The the. The panels were 10 by 10 inches mm -hmm. by one inch, three quarters of an inch, done on very high class, um, like marine grade plywood, something you would use to mm -hmm. finish stuff off. 
and uh, the boxes were a few inches bigger and about four inches deep. I know I, I can, I, I still make them. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm working on a project right now where I'm doing 36 paintings, all the same size, all the same size as the ones I made in the 70s. And th that sort of talks about the circle of coming around from, from moving forward, but coming back to a place mm -hmm. where you, you started. So what I wanted was a horizon line and a familiar shape. So I just chose a house shape, or some people call it a barn, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a straight on look at a five-sided five um, shape, peaked mm -hmm. roof with a, you know, a house shape. And I just sat it on the horizon line and um, built, built around that. And uh, I'm still doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to it. The house always stayed a constant size. Now I'm using uh, different, different, I'm moving it around. And uh, it's, it's almost like it's completely new work. But um, to answer your question, I, I've always wondered, was it like, the, the reason, I, I never really had a house until I was 45 mm -hmm. years old. I never considered my parents' house my house because we moved every four years. Yeah. I never had a house. Um, someone also told me, he said, you know, the reason you use circles a lot is there, there are holes in your paintings. There's, a, there's these holes that can, can show loss and stuff like like certain emotions are, 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 are illustrated by your use. I don't, I don't really, I don't sp specifically set out to do that. If, if my paintings uh, give someone a, a question to ask, I think that's great. I mean, if there's any attention at all, you know, yeah. whether it's like, what the hell are you doing that for? But the house shape was, you know, really out of just kind of frustration and, and necessity at, at and then when, once I got c comfortable with it, I remember uh, Marsha Tucker, who was the curator at the Whitney Museum, mm -hmm. had just left, and I met her, and she saw a couple pieces of my work. She gave me a, an award in a competitive show. And um, when she started the new museum, um, I was in a show called Outside New York. Mm -hmm. And it was eight or nine artists who lived outside New York, but were going to be showing in New York. And I, I, sh I showed some of the house pieces. And I remember th there was a pretty good review of the show in, in the Village Voice, except that it said, Dan Rizzi is living in the house that Joel Shapiro created. And I didn't know who Joel Shapiro was. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, for those of you who don't, he, he made these little stainless steel houses, almost mm -hmm. like Monopoly pieces. I, you know, I, I don't, I think my, you know, my work was on paper or, or on, uh, uh, his were three-dimensional, mine were flat. Mm -hmm. In a way, if you give a, a gorilla a, a, a pencil, he'll come up with that shape after, and a ruler, he'll, he'll come up with that shape after a while. You know, it's not, it's not a, a real complicated thing, but... I later on found out a lot of people use that shape. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's used in signs. It's used in it's it's, yeah. it's almost like an, an, an international symbol of, of a house, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the time, you know, you have to. Uh, that's when, you know, we all hated critics because they they didn't have anything nice to say. They just said, "Oh, he's copying so and so." I I'm, I can't copy somebody whose work I never saw. I mean, we both sort of started using it around the same time. And I did eventually meet Joel Shapiro and talk to him about it. Um, it's not, it's not, a, it's, it's not a, a shape that belongs to one person. No, of course not. Yeah. And then later on in your body of work, you start doing flowers that look like actual flowers. And yeah. fruit that looks like actual fruit. Yeah, that was that's that's weird. The, it is. The, it's a little strange because what, everything up until then is is what you call uh, 
reduced. Reduced and, and geometric and flat and, yes. and hard edged. And um, the, my, my explanation for that, I never ever really lived anywhere other than a city. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to college uh, for four years in a little liberal arts college right outside Little Rock, Arkansas, um, which when I met, met uh, President Bill Clinton, who, who was the governor of Arkansas, said it was one of his favorite schools, this little place called Hendricks College. And I guess that's the closest to, country, to a, living in the country I did, but, but usually I lived in Washington, D.C. Or, 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 uh, or, or New York City or Cairo or Jordan. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all hard-edged. I have to wind it up. We've run out of time. But I, when I moved when I moved out here, I I I moved to the uh, you know to, to North Haven Sag Harbor, and all of a sudden there were birds in the trees. There were flowers right. coming. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to not you know. Yeah. So. Well, we've come to the end. It's been great, Dan. I've enjoyed it. Really, it's it's been a lot of fun, and. Uh, where are you showing next? Um, I'm hoping that I will be able to do a show that's planned uh, at my, uh, my undergraduate school, the one I just described. And they just built a brand new brick, steel, and glass museum. Mm. And uh, they want, want to give me a show. Mm -hmm. And I really want to do, do that, but we, we have to wait and see. I also have a bunch of small works sitting in a little gallery in London, and we're waiting to show those. Uh, but pretty much, uh, I show with uh, uh, Peter Marcel, yeah, uh, M, &M, M, &M, M Art. Uh, I, I have a painting up right now in one of their shows. I had a wonderful show with the drawing room in East Hampton. Yeah. And as soon as we can start showing again, yeah, uh, right. uh, I'm, I'm I'm work. I didn't work for the first few months of the pandemic, but I'm really working now, and I'm I'm producing like crazy every day. And um, I'm hoping that when things clear up, I'll have a, a a nice, interesting new body of work to show and a place to show it that right. that, that that we can do without compromising right. ourselves. Okay, I have to. Well, that's it, folks. We're done. I've been talking with Dan Rizzi, and. Uh, I've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. I